Welcome to the National Science and Technology Metals Foundation's STEM Spotlight Series, where we're meeting the top minds in STEM to learn more about their paths to success. I'm Sarah Williams, a science journalist, and chatting with me today is Raven Baxter, also known as Raven the Science Maven. Raven is a science educator who has a really unique and fun style. She's had science rap videos go viral. She recently gave a TEDx talk about fostering change in STEM culture, and she interviews scientists on a show called STEMBASY. She also has recently been named to the Fortune Top 40 Under 40. Thank you for joining me today, Raven. Can you start out telling me about how you got where you are today? You know, what drew you to study molecular biology and what at the same time first made you so passionate about communicating science in so many cool and interesting ways? Yeah, um, well, I think that my interest in molecular biology in particular started when I was in college. And when I started college, I was an environmental policy and law major. And it wasn't until I took a genetics course that I realized how strong of an interest I had in biology. And one of the things that sparked my interest in molecular biology was learning about how in genetics um, our body follows a code. It's a language and I thought it was so interesting that our bodies speak a language and it's a language that we all speak. It's the genetic code that keeps us all alive and helps generate our life processes and so few of us are really aware of how special and unique that is. Um, this one thing that really ties us, ties every living thing together. Um, so I thought that was beautiful and I wanted to learn more about like what goes on at the most microscopic levels of like what life means on, on earth at least. Okay. And what more recently has made you pivot and really be, be more interested in the kind of education and communication angle? Yeah, so I I ended up um, graduating with a biology degree and then also getting a master's degree in biology and I worked as a corporate molecular scientist and um, I realized that I wasn't quite being afforded these opportunities that I wanted to have to interact with the community and interact with the public because I was in the lab all day and it's hard to foster those relationships when you are not visible to your community. Um, so I actually made a decision to leave that environment altogether because I wanted to be more visible. Um, and I wanted to teach. I wanted to share everything that I was learning with the world. Good. So what does a, a normal work day or work week look like for you? You know, how do you balance school and making music videos and hosting this online talk show and posting on social media and all this other plethora of things you do to communicate and educate about science? I started a lot of these things on my own uh, and I still do pretty much almost everything on my own, but Stembassy, I'm backed by five other women who are powerhouses in their own right and we all kind of carry the weight to make sure that show is a success. Um, and then as far as my day to day goes with school, I have a dissertation coach who helps to keep me on track and holds me accountable for deadlines and meeting deadlines and um, so I can graduate on time, which is hopefully in a few months. Woo! Um, and so I always and very transparent about like, I know it looks like I'm pummeling through all of these things and attacking all these things by myself, but it's important to also have a team around you of people who support you and wanna see you succeed and want to see your project succeed. Um, as far as making music goes, I do all of that myself. Um, my day-to-day -day process as somebody in science communication, um, really business first i always have like a lot of loose ends to tie um up with with people that i'm partnering with but on the creative side i love to think about um what questions do i have to answer today or what questions do people online have for me that i can answer and um what can i answer with the tools around me at my disposal at, in an entertaining way so 
I'm I'm doing a lot of things every day. It's kind of it's kind of like a well maintained tornado. <laughs> Um, but it's a fun tornado, a fun, a fun NATO. Good. Um, so a lot of your social media messaging includes hashtags like what a scientist looks like. I look like a scientist. You recently gave the TEDx talk titled You Don't Look Like a Scientist. Talk to me about why it's so important to have diversity in what scientists look like and how they're portrayed. So when we're talking about science, when we, you know, the whole field is dedicated to answering questions and solving problems, we need diversity if we want to do the best science that we possibly can. Um, if we want to explore every single angle of, of solutions that, you know, are possible, we need to have people who are thinking in different ways, you know, people with different life experiences, you know, all of these things matter. They all contribute to how we think and how we process information. So we're not going to get very far in science if we have people in the same room who are all the same. It's, it's just, it's a setup for failure. And I don't want to see science fail. I want to see science progress. And so I spend some of my time um, sending messages out in the science universe that it's important for us to have diversity and really normalizing different figures of scientists in the space. And so my TED talk, in my TED talk, um, or my TEDx talk, I talked about my experiences as a scientist and how often when I've walked into spaces where people were doing science or, or where science was being taught, people often assumed that I didn't belong there. Um, and that was usually based on my appearance. And so, um, you know, I talked about my experiences and how that affected me, but also why it's important that we work hard to make sure that that does not continue to happen. And uh, I use music and creativity to kind of break down those societal constructs of what a scientist looks like um, so that we can continue to progress science as a whole. and advocate for more diversity in, in STEM as a whole. We hear about diversity and representation among scientists a lot, but I know that you also work on issues around inclusivity when it comes to science communicators. Just last week, you were involved in Black in SciComm Week. Why is this so important and what kinds of things have you done or seen others do that you think really help support minority science communicators? So 2020 has been a a wild ride for pretty much everyone on the planet. Um, and we are all struggling individually in our own ways, but certain groups of people are really heavily impacted, not only by the pandemic, but also by racial injustice and civil unrest. And we've for example, black people are, are one of those groups that have been negatively impacted this year by um, things that are in addition to the pandemic. And it, it is tiring. It is stressful to have to worry about these things and to um, experience this kind of uh, culture, this kind of climate. And for science communicators who happen to be black, it has been very challenging to balance voices, right? Because we're using our voices to communicate. And in times where we feel like our lives are at stake, right? When, when we have to advocate for the question of whether our lives matter or not. And um, that become, it becomes very, difficult to balance your scientific voice with your voice for your own humanity. And so what I've been finding is that many black science communicators such as, my, such as myself have been exhausted, especially this summer, because we're really working double time. We're trying to talk about science, but also we're screaming to the world, hey, our people are suffering. We need help. Um, we need, we need laws changed. We need to be protected. Like we are afraid, please help. Um, and 
And so we were tired. And so I started Black in Science Communication because I realized that this was an issue. And I wanted to create a, in, a group that can support Black science communicators. But uh, we just had Black in Science Communication Week, which was October 4th through October 10th, 2020. And this was a week that was filled with workshops, um, panels, we had a keynote speaker, we had parties, we had a um, lightning talks contest and a mini grants prize opportunity where we were giving away, we gave away thousands of dollars to people in the science communication community. And the workshops were meant to pour skills and best practices into new and upcoming science communicators. Um, and the and the speaker, the keynote speaker, was somebody who spoke about how to use our training as scientists to build and heal communities. Um, and so we we I created this group to invest in science communication um, and make sure that we are building scientists while sharing our science. Okay. Do you think we're making progress when it comes to diversity and representation in both science and science communication? I think so. I absolutely think so. I think that this year, especially, people are realizing the importance of having diverse representation in education as a whole, um, it's so important to have someone who's teaching you to be able to relate to them. I, that's just proven in the research. So I, I think that people are, even people who aren't aware of the research understand that and are actively working towards amplifying marginalized voices in, in science and science communication to make sure that at least other people have the opportunities to hear and see people who don't look like them um, talk about science. Okay. I also want to hear a little bit more about your music videos, which are rap parodies of science issues. They're really fun. And if anyone listening hasn't seen them, definitely Google Raven the Science Maven and check them out. How did you first come up with those? And how do you try to balance entertainment and education when you're creating them? I'm just a very goofy person. <laughs> um, I, you know, I I try to get away as far as possible from the most common ways that science is taught, with the understanding that science is science, no matter how you present it, um, as long as it's factual information, as long as you're getting people curious about doing science. I think that's great. And so for me, when I get really excited about something in science, I actually, for some, for some odd reason, a song just pops up in my head. I don't know why I'm like this. <laughs> um, my, my partner, he calls me a Muppet. He calls me a human Muppet. It's probably because my personality is very much of like a sing-songy, fuzzy puppet. <laughs> like where, um, you know, I can just... It comes naturally. I can just drop into song at any point in time. So it, you know, I ended up when the pandemic hit, I said, oh, my gosh, what am I going to do with all of this time that I have? I'm sitting at home. I'm working from home. But my daily routine looks different. I have a lot of free time. And I just started writing science songs. And eventually that turned into an album. And um, I think the day after... New York got sent into like a mandatory uh, stay at home order. Uh, the, that next day, I made a music video <laughs> about COVID-19 prevention that, that went viral. Um, but my intention with that was just to calm everybody down um, because I had I was actually tracking the virus in January, like early January. And I knew that this was going to happen, but it seemed like everyone in my immediate circle was very shocked. So I made a music video to calm people down and just tell them this is what's happening. All you have to do 
stay at home, <laughs> wash your hands, um, disinfect, you know, and we can we can take care of this. At that point in time, wearing a mask was not uh, immediately like recommended. It, it was a little while later, but I would have added that in the song if that was a hot topic at that point. Okay. You also host this talk show, Stembassy, where you interview a diverse collection of scientists and you post other videos on neat science experiments and topics in science. What's kind of the ultimate goal of your videos and your messaging when you look at them all as a connection? You know, who are you making these for and what do you want people to take away from watching? I think that it's very important, especially now, for people to have relationships with scientists and so Stembassy is really cool in that we are we are just some really cool scientists who get together every we get together every week and we talk about science and we bring on new people every week to introduce new perspectives new ideas new work that we can talk about and we do it in front of a live audience so people can ask us questions in real time we have a lot of repeat audience members, so people are actively interested in forging relationships with us and having relationships with scientists and people that they can identify and trust and relate to to get their scientific information. Um, and, you know, we've, we've really just made ourselves very proud of how we are accessible. Um, and that was something that we really felt strongly about when the pandemic started because we had a lot of people throwing conspiracy theories, you know, at us. And why is this? People were just trying to figure out why is this happening? This has never happened to us before. Why now? And um, so there's there's a lot of importance in making sure that scientists are accessible to the public and available to answer questions that people might have about the science and the issues that are going around um, them that are related to science. And then, so you're also pursuing this PhD in science education. Tell me about the research you're doing as part of your dissertation and how that has helped shape and inform your work you're doing. Um, so my dissertation is actually centered around my work as a science communicator and the reason why it is is because I have done some things in science communication that have not ever been done before and that particular and I'm talking about one thing in particular and that is one of my music videos it's called the big old geeks music video and it was the first time that rap culture had unapologetically and um, unapologetically been merged with science culture and and it was done so in a way that had no filter right the visuals had no filter it resembled very much like any other rap video that you would see you know the, the style of dancing the attire the setting but the lyrics were all completely scientific and very technical so it was a mashup of two cultures that had never been mashed up before in that way. Usually when people do science rap videos, it's a very tame um, and filtered presentation of what rap is. And I believe in authenticity. And so people's reactions to what I did in that music video were very strong because it had never been done before and I was providing a new type of representation in science. And it was important for me to study the reactions because I wanted to know how do people relate to the representation that I was providing. For my study I interviewed people from um, a really big spectrum uh, across age, gender, ethnic background, etc. But my data for my dissertation, I'm specifically focusing on black women. Um, and I wanted to understand how black women who either have STEM careers or don't, how do they relate to science in the context of my music video? And what I found, well, I guess I'll tell you one of the most exciting findings of my study was that 
even in adulthood, women, black women who did not choose a STEM career, so these are people who are police officers, judges, maybe they work for like government agencies or, you know, anything that's not science, tech, engineering, or math related directly. They said that if they had the type of representation that I created in my music video when they were younger, that they would have at least tried to pursue a STEM career because they felt so strongly connected to the representation. And that's, that's adult women and women who are not in STEM. And that is actually a population that's, when, we, when researchers ask the question of um, why do we have such a gap in representation in STEM fields, they almost always study people who already have STEM careers. Yeah. But they leave out people who didn't choose STEM, like especially adults. They, they very rarely ask adults, why didn't you choose STEM? But that's a huge, that's a huge um, source, a huge resource for us to understand where, where we're going wrong. <laughs> Um, and how can we improve in how science is presented so we can so we can recapture or capture interest and grow the STEM field. Okay. Did you get feedback from anyone on how to make like your music videos or your communication even more accessible or things that people would really like to see more of? Not necessarily, but I think that some of the The overall feedback that I got was that it was very inspirational to see women, um, and because I interviewed women, a, a broad percentage of the women in my study felt liberated because the type of representation that I provided was so, it shattered pretty much every box that um, black women in science are put in, right? When we enter these fields, we're often told that we have to wear our hair straight. If we have an afro, we have to straighten it because, you know, whatever reason, society. Or we can't wear t clothes that are too tight or bright colors or we can't talk a certain way or, um, gosh, even down to the music that we choose to listen to when we're doing our experiments or... Um, how we, you know, we can't stick up for ourselves because we, we would be considered angry. It's, there are so many little things that, like, confine a black woman's experience in science. And um, I worked really hard in that music video to shatter all of those barriers. And so even for women who were not in science, they felt liberated just to be able to see that you can basically be your unapologetic self and be anybody who you want it to be, but still, like, be seen as competent and still um, survive and thrive happily in the in the field. Do you miss the lab at all? Are there times you're talking to scientists and wish you could get back and do experiments and make discoveries? I definitely enjoy talking to scientists and, and learning about their discoveries, but it comes at a cost, right? Right now, STEM culture, science culture is not in a place where many scientists are encouraged to do things other than research. So for example, I, um, in applying for a PhD program, I applied to a biology PhD program and I applied to a science education PhD program. And the biology PhD program, I was considered for the program. I had done three rounds of interviews and everything was, went very well. But at the end of the day, they did not accept me because I had an interest in science communication and science education. And even though at, at that point in time when I was being interviewed for the PhD program, I had a master's degree, right, and I, in biology, molecular biology, and I had also had two years of working as a corporate research scientist under my belt. The minute that I expressed that I wanted to teach people about science while getting a PhD in biology, they didn't like it. And so even though I love research, um, it's 
if I were to be back in the lab and if I were to be a practicing scientist, I know that it would be very difficult for me at this point to continue doing what I love. Um, and what I'm equally as passionate about, which is being in the community and showing humanity and appreciating, you know, um, the people in, in the communities that, that love science. So, um, and that's something, that's a huge issue and it's something that I'm working to improve. Um, though, attacking that and making sure that there's a diversity of options for our scientists who are in school um, is something that's high up on my list of things that I want to do uh, in the future. So hopefully, hopefully, when you ask somebody this question in five years, they'll say, oh yeah, you know, I can be in the lab in the morning and work at a community center, you know, in the, in the afternoon and nobody cares, like it's, it's normal. But right now, that's not, that's not something that can be done, really. A lot of our viewers are students, and I think they look at someone like you and think, wow, what a cool and fun job, but how could I possibly succeed doing that? What is your advice to students who are really passionate about science and love talking about science, but don't necessarily know how to translate that into a job? Well, there's there's a lot of different... I, I learned this, actually, last week during Black and Science Communication Week, because we had panels of different types of science communicators. And uh, I think if you occupy the online space, you would probably be more aware that people can make videos and talk about science. And that's just one small piece of what it means to communicate about science. You can be a science writer. You can, which means that you can write children's books about science. You can work for journal organizations, you could work for major publications like the New York Times and be a science writer for the New York Times. I mean, there's there are so many different ways you could do that. That's just one thing. You could work in science illustration, right? So in the same capacity that you can write about science, you can also draw, you could be an illustrator for children's books, you could be a textbook illustrator, a medical illustrator. Um, you could work in the legal field, right? communicating science as a patent attorney. Actually, I, my best friend's an attorney and she said that patent attorneys have to have a STEM degree. Mm -hmm. You can't be a patent attorney without a STEM degree because you need to have that scientific background. So that's another way you can communicate science. Um, gosh, you can work in the informal learning space. So working in museums where you can talk to people in person about science and create exhibits for people to enjoy. Um, camps and nature nature park or nature trails and nature organizations you could be a lobbyist right and talk to politicians about science so um, do what feels naturally to you but what SciComm looks like for you is not necessarily what it is for me so you don't have to be like me and make rap music videos um, or be online or even in any digital space doing it you can I would say explore different options and whatever is the most natural and most comfortable for you, I would pursue that. What about for students who do want to stick with science but feel like discouraged and that there aren't a lot of scientists who look or come across like them? Do you have advice from, you know, when you made it through your degrees and your working in industry about how to stick with it and, you know, how to succeed in that environment? Luckily, I, I had a very positive experience throughout my educational career um, and a lot of my mentors and people who were advising me did not look like me, but they were allies and they understood how important it was for them to be supportive of me and um, they're, they're wonderful people. So I'm very fortunate you know, to not have had any negative experiences there. But it's not always promised to be that way. Sometimes you will enter into spaces and people don't treat you with the respect that you deserve. And um, even before that might happen, you might just walk in a space and maybe nobody's treating you wrong, but you just don't feel welcome because you there's no diversity and you feel like you're the only person there. Maybe nobody's really gonna understand you and nobody can really relate. So um, I would, I always advocate for people to get a support group, right? There's plenty of support groups online. So even if you 
maybe in your real life or your personal through your personal connections you might not have not you might not feel that support there but there are a lot of digital spaces that are being created right now um, for affinity groups and for people to kind of find each other and find a network of of others who have shared experiences and um, that's a good way to support but um, on a day-to-day -day basis I would say just keep telling yourself that you belong in the space. You do belong there. You deserve to be there. You've earned your spot to be there. And there's there's nothing wrong with you embracing who you are in that space. And never doubt that, that you deserve anything less than what the people around you um, are getting. And um, you know, just keep affirming that, that you do belong there and try to make the best of it. Great advice. Well, where do you envision your career going? Are there things on the horizon that we should keep an eye out for or, you know, lofty goals that you see in your future? Uh, um, well, I feel like there's something new every day. <laughs> um, it's hard for me to even keep up with myself. But... Um, I am working on some shows that will be um, online and or on television. All of those details are being worked out at this point in time. I'm working on a children's book. Um, let's see. I will always be working on new music. Um, <laughs> there's just there are so many things. Um, but I, I'm really enjoying the process of just being creative and just trying trying to communicate science in as many ways as possible. I know recently I started doing bilingual science communication because I do speak Spanish and um, I didn't realize how many people needed that. Like, uh, I know this isn't answering your question, but another thing, a point that I wanted to make was that um, like try try out new ways of SciComm. Like even and it doesn't even have to be perfect. For example, if if you want to teach people one sign, like in in sign language, um, if you wanted to teach somebody a new science word in sign language a week, do that. Like that that can be something easy. You don't have to learn the entire language, but you're at least exposing people to. Um, ways to be accessible and ways to like understand diversity in science and what that looks like. Our final question, we're asking all the panelists in this series, in all of your free time that I can tell you have, what are you reading, watching, or listening to right now, STEM related or not? Well, um, I did just watch Neil Tyson's masterclass on science communication. And that was really cool because um, he talked a lot about like how to have conversations about science with people who maybe aren't quite affiliated with science and that is so important and so helpful today because we have we're in this culture right now where people who don't understand science are kind of using that as a weapon <laughs> against other people who do understand science. And I think that people have to understand that just because they don't know something doesn't mean it's bad. It is an invitation to explore into that concept and not necessarily reject the concept altogether. It's a chance to ask questions and be curious. And so Neil Tyson was basically explaining how to foster that curiosity in other people, and also how to handle situations where you're talking and trying to explain science to someone who's not necessarily accepting what you have to say about science. And I think that's important, especially when my main platform is online, um, how we communicate <laughs> with people who don't necessarily agree with us is very important. Um, and I, my, one of my biggest priorities is to maintain a positive culture around science. So it's important that we figure out how to treat each other with respect <laughs> as we're teaching science. Absolutely. Well, I'm very excited to see what you have coming up next because you're always doing lots of exciting things. And thank you so much for chatting today. That was great.
Thanks for having me, Sarah. I had a great time. This is the National Science and Technology Metals Foundation's STEM Spotlight Series. I'm Sarah Williams. Thanks for joining us.